Welcome to this time of very essential, fundamental, and important meditation that we're going to have on such a core doctrine as to what it means to be born again. What does it mean to be, quote, chosen before the foundation or from the foundation of the world? Now, this is vital for airship. This is vital for eternal life. This is a vital understanding of what it means to be born from above. What does from above mean? We're going to have to look at that. Now, what's fascinating is that John the Baptist had a message of preparation for the advent of God in the flesh. That's what he was there to do, is to prepare God's people for the advent of of God in the flesh, the true inheritor. So what we need to understand is what is this message that needs to go to the entire world in which the, quote, the ax is laid to the root? What's the root issue? What do we need to understand in regard to everyone knows, if you're a Jew, that the Messiah has everything to do with the ultimate kind of purpose of Israel, and that is to receive the inheritance that God has promised the reward of eternal life, the reward of righteousness, the reward of sonship, the war, the reward of being an heir of God, of the great inheritance, which is what? Eternal presence face to face with God's face shining upon you in infinite blessings, being lavished, loved, and being extravagantly provided for by the eternal God and having no condemnation, having no sin, having no shame that we could dwell with the eternal God forever and ever and ever in his infinite kind of presence of holiness and not perish, not perish, but live and receive the blessings, the the happy countenance, the smile of God upon us in which his countenance is radiating and resting upon us and is well pleased with us in which he lavishes us with the riches of his love, the riches of his generosity and his providing care. And this is the inheritance. And so John the Baptist was to prepare the bride for the bridegroom. He makes it abundantly clear. That's in the scriptures. Paul sees himself espousing God's people to the bridegroom in preparing the bride. So what is essential for now? Is Christ soon to return? And are we to, quote, lay the axe to the root? What's the root? What does it mean to be perfect before God? What does it mean to be the object of the lavishing of his acceptance, his radiant um, pl pleasure where he's so well pleased with us. It's fascinating in counseling. You know, they have done all kinds of research and fundamentally they believe that people are motivated based on one of two things. Either to be accepted. People will do things. People will have ambitions and goals. People will really, you know, strive for many things in their life in order to be accepted. And there are people or those that strive and do things and are motivated and are prompted because of the fact that they are accepted. But acceptance is huge. So what does it mean to be, quote, well-pleasing to God, to be accepted of God? We're going to have to look at something that's going to be hard to deal with. Paul talks about himself being, quote, born out of season in 1 Corinthians 15. And do you know what the word is in the Greek? Aborted child. I was born aborted. I was born disqualified. I was born a stillborn. You go through the translations and we'll, we'll look at it. Stillborn. Aborted child a fetus that has been rejected. And why are you going to see later on that Paul says, I was chosen from the foundation of the world to preach the gospel to the Gentiles for airship purposes. I thought they were aborted children. What is the dealio with God looking at someone 
who was initially disqualified and saying that you are of no inheritance. You are, quote, a stillborn. Now I look at you as if you were born and that you are accepted and chosen from the foundation of the world. And you should be dancing in circles and doing backflips and dancing in the street or as David was dancing before the ark. You should be beside yourself like Paul was. This is the gospel. We must understand the foundation that God is referencing, not the foundation that we assess or that our peers or that our friends or that our speculative ideas think is the the foundation purpose as to why God is so pleased with you. What's the foundation of that? What is the confidence that you should have? And, and real quick, before we jump into the verses here, the essential understanding is for these times, I don't believe any teaching is worth anything unless it's preparing you for the return of Christ. I think there's no value in the teaching or the preaching or any, quote, ministerial reason for talking unless you are learning how to be confident in your position in Christ, what you have in Christ, what is your safety in Christ? And for you to flee to Christ, what it means to lay a hold of Christ, to reside, abide, and to infinitely, desperately, and intensely with great intentional deliberateness, hide in Christ. What does that mean to have faith Vital, essential, trusting, authentic, without hypocrisy, faith, total confidence in Christ and being fully convinced of that. Being heart, mind, soul, strength given over and saying, I'm trusting in him. What is the value of preaching if it is not that? This is important. All right, let me see. I have no watchers right now, so I'm going to see if, in fact... Um, I've already been booted out. This is not fun. Sorry, guys, I have to do this. Because there we go. I'm so sorry I have to do this. Sorry, everybody. Wow. Okay, here we go. All right, good, good, good to see you guys. Hey guys, I'm so sorry. A lot of times there's zero people uh, on here, and then, um, and then I find out later on, I was just talking to the wind for an hour and forty five minutes, and I don't want to do that. Here we go. Okay, um, if you missed the intro, please go back. It's very essential that you go back, and I don't have to restart this broadcast again. What is laying the axe the root? What does it mean, quote, to be stillborn, to be aborted, to be disqualified, to be estranged from the womb, to be born and shapen in iniquity, born in sin, And to be born disqualified by nature, and then yet God says to a Jew, a good Jew of good stock, saying you must be born again. And he doesn't say born again. If you look in the Greek, he says born from above. What does it mean to be born from above? What is laying the axe to the root of the ground? What is true repentance? What is the message that John the Baptist was given? Why was he preaching Isaiah chapter 40 so intensely as a, quote, groomsman preparing the bride, the people of God, the, quote, the tender and delicate virgin bride, supposedly. And he's baptizing as a form of washing and and preparation and cleansing of repentance of a preparation for this woman to receive her bridegroom. This is the whole purpose of the advent of Christ. Anytime there's advent message, it's always tied to wedding, matrimonial. The swashbuckling coming in of a bridegroom dramatically coming in on a donkey or on a horse, on a steed, on a 
stallion to rescue his, to capture, to lay hold of, to take away his bride. And what's the necessary preparation? What does it mean to understand what it means to be an inheritor and what is our position by nature and how are we born again, born from above? All right, let's look at it. Matthew 3, 4 through 12. John himself was clothed in camel's hair. Yes, in a rough garment. Testifying to, quote, he is like Elijah. We are not to be in fine garments here on this earth. We are to be in repentance. We are to be exposed as to our true need and our nature and our own uncleanness. And this is important that when you have the Holy Spirit, that God exposes that process because no true cleansing is without, without the revelation of your filth, right? So if you're already clean, why would you be washing yourself? So with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts, prodigal son story, interesting. Because if you want to look at locusts or locust pods, the word for, quote, the husks that the prodigal son was scarfing down, go look at the word. It'll be like locust pods or whatever, but it's the word. Are you ready for this? Little horn. Little horn. Rebellion. We're munching down and we are feasting upon us, Gubalon. That which is just but a covering, no nutritional value whatsoever, but it's an outward display, but it's of little nutritional value. And the word for the prodigal son, husks, is the word little horn. It's the word little horn. So it's important to understand that we can cloak ourselves in this low nutrition display. And it's only, quote, devouring us, locusts. Wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region round about the Jordan, went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Muddy. Remember the king, the Syrian king? There's better places, cleaner places, more extravagant, elaborate places. Go get baptized. We have better rivers in Lebanon. Why in the world are we being baptized in the muddy Jordan? Well, it's a confession, isn't it? It's a realization of our filth, isn't it? But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Wow. Go back to Isaiah. Go back to this brood of vipers um, orientation. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Worthy of repentance. In other words, you need to have your sins exposed. He says it again to another Pharisee, not John the Baptist, but Christ, the same message. John bore testimony of me. And guess what? You need to be born again. Born again, we're good Jews. Watch how this study goes. And do not think to say to yourselves the internal narrative language, you guys, the quiet language we're munching on. Little horn, husks, pig food, little horn narratives. We have Abraham as our father. Presumption. Assuming yourselves into some top banana place. You're not there. You're only there as you'll see through the study and it'll be shown over and over again. This is your orientation as to who you are in Christ. God is referencing you by faith, through faith, through your dependence. And when you are saying, don't look at me because you've shown me who I am. I'm a stillborn. I am an aborted fetus. 
That's all I am by nature. God, there's no reason for me to be an inheritor. I am nothing. I am less than nothing. View me as I am in one who was born of an embryo and redid my life over and literally lived out the covenantal sonship that should have been for me to live out. He has lived this out as my inher- as the inheritor. Let me co-inherit. Let me be seated with him. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from those stones. And we know the Hebrew wordplay of stone and children. Eben bana is the same word. Foundation stones. Verse 10 says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. How? He's talking about the issue of sonship and what it means to be born again and not assuming that you are in the right position with God because you have a wonderfully laid out life and your life checks out like Paul. Paul looked at the law and he says, I'm blameless. But I realized that this was husks, scubalon, that this is but a scab dung wrapping to be thrown away, just a covering, I was feeding on the little horn brain mentality, presumption. I was hotly persecuting the church like the little horn power of Daniel. You think Paul never read the book of Daniel? I looked to cast the sanctuary, the truth to the ground and trample the sanctuary underfoot and persecute the church. I am the least of the apostles. I showed myself not to be a good Jew, but a stillborn, a cast out, an embryo that was aborted. Until we understand that, we haven't even begun the journey of what it means to be saved before God. Rich and increasing in goods and have need of nothing and to be presumptuous and say, I'm already in a good position with God is not the solution nor the formula to be right with God in all irony, brokenness and humility and realizing who you are in the position of a of another who is the Messiah, who is Christ, who has laid the, quote, axe to the root and has redone human history, a second Adam, and lived out covenantal humanness before God in our stead is the only, is the only one, is the holy one, is the, quote, born uh, before God and the Messiah and sonship and heirship and all of the blessings of heirship of what it means to be, quote, the elect chosen, the Holy One, is all bound up in one person's history. Deferring you, excuse me, deferring from you to your representative. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What's the fruit God is looking for? Repentance. Worthy of repentance. Being exposed. That from this rotten tree, we have rotten roots. We have fruits that is worthy of repentance. So shall be cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow. To Sadducees and Pharisees who live a perfect and moral life of holy living, keeping all the feasts, wearing all the costume of jewelry, of keeping all the commandments with meticulous, like we're talking tithing, mint, dill, cumin, that's hard to do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four. That's how they did it. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. We know that is a direct reference to Ruth and Boaz. We know that that has to do with inheritance, adoption, hem of the garment, wedding, healing in his wings, heirship. This is the focus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What's the chaff? Scubalon. All of the fake, all of the display, 
all those who presume, all those who say, Lord, Lord, and all those who will be in a crushing, dashing, head against a stone, shocking realization that they are not inheritors. They assumed, but they were not built on the true foundation in which God acknowledges, and you're going to see what that is. So Isaiah chapter 40, John the Baptist message, verse 1 and then 3 through 9 says, comfort yourselves. Yes, comfort my people. Fortify my people. Secure my people. Settle my people. Put them in on a sure foundation, says your God, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is Isaiah 40. This is what John was preaching. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. Humility all brought to the same flat threshing floor ground. To be judged, to be examined. And everything will be examined and it'll be of what? Of no intrinsic value. See, the, the, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, the foundation stone is a tried stone, and we realize that there's no other foundation outside the foundation that God acknowledges, which is his son, Christ, and we'll have to take a look at the process of the study. What is the foundation of God versus what is the foundation of this world, or what is the foundation in which human vanity has built, and it will all be wiped away at the brightness of his coming? Every valley shall be exalted, every... Mountain hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight and the rough places smooth. He's going to turn this into a threshing floor. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. This is a powerful thing. As we go through the study, we're going to start realizing how does God justify you? How does God call you a son, a daughter, an heir, an inheritor, an elect, a chosen, a holy one? That which is perfect before God and well-pleasing to him. What is the basis of this? All flesh shall see it together. I believe that. I believe that Christ will come in the clouds of glory. I believe every eye shall see him. I believe that we shall all stand before the glory of God. Be it righteous, be it wicked. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he says, what shall I cry and what do we? What is the great cry? Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Everything done under the sun has no intrinsic value to it. It is faded glory. All grass, all flesh, grass, all its loveliness is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, non-enduring. The flower fades. That's the glory. That's the glory of man. Because the breath of the Lord is blown upon it, slain by the brightness of his coming. This is something that cannot stand before God. It has no eternal value in which God could say, this is well-pleasing. You stand forever. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. Passing, fading. The flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Zion, the foundation stone, where you're going to see as we go through the course of this study, that the foundation that God has built upon and everything that comes from that foundation before the foundation of the world in which you're going to three, see the three persons of the Godhead as they are, quote, gathered together and as they speak as one, as they speak in a unified front, as an echad, as the government of God is based upon those three that agree. That's what they do. You see it in John. They agree together, and then they establish what is so, and then the command goes out, and then it's ministered to by angels. And what is this being born from above? What does it mean that God says from the foundation of the world, which is actually above, where God sits? A more sure foundation, an eternal foundation, a well-pleasing foundation, a foundation in which he builds for eternity. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, good news, the gospel. Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. What is the high mountain? It's talking about the throne of God, seated with God in heavenly places, at the right hand of God, 
seated with God as co-heirs, seeing your position in your Messiah, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And we're not destroyed, face to face, open faced, not destroyed. Tell the world where we seated at the top of the mountain with whom the lamb slain from what? The foundation of the world. Go and preach the world. Go preach to the Gentiles. Be a light unto the Gentiles. Speak from that position and say that God has, quote, a lamb slain at the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, in which you may approach God and be unafraid. Be unafraid. And in fact, that's the rejoicing. That's the good news. That's what we rejoice. That's why we skip about. That's why we skip upon bout, Mount, uh, what is it, the peak of Bethere in the Song of Solomon, that you're hitting Mount Peaks. You're skipping as a, quote, a hind, a row, a gazelle, that you're jumping up on this mountain and you're jumping up to the top and you're not destroyed. You are seated with God. The good news is, is that God has based your, quote, sonship on another foundation and not on the stone foundation of a rotten Adam that failed, but on a second Adam that prevailed. We stay on Isaiah 40, 21 to 23. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? And everybody, every prophet, every heir of salvation, every person that proclaims the good news comes from the orientation from a place from the, quote, foundations of the earth before the foundations of the earth, our position that we have in the Messiah, in our creator and savior. Have you not understood orientation from the foundations of earth? And yet you were a teacher in Israel, Nicodemus. And yet you don't understand the position that you have to be born again in him who is from above, to be born from above, to be orientated and referenced from his heirship. Verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth what does it mean? This is an Ezekiel reference, but that Ezekiel reference that talks about from on high at the top of the wheels, then wheels on the circle. It's talking about the throne of God in which we hear a voice in which God sends angels. Where is that? In the sanctuary. And it's inhabitants like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. This is actually... A reference from the Psalms that Moses gave. I think it's Psalms 103, if I'm not mistaken. What's the first Psalm ever written? It's actually written by Moses. It's the most beautiful Hebrew poetry. There are some people that only study Hebrew only to read Moses' Psalm. I think it's 103 that talks about the heavens being stretched out as a curtain as the most beautiful Hebrew um, language poetry ever written. And people will just study Hebrew only to Read that psalm and understand it in the Hebrew. It's the most majestic picture of God's foundation and his throne in which he makes all of these things. And we all serve and are submissive to him and are subject to him. But it is the orientation from his throne room. And we're going to have to orientate ourselves to understand what it means to be accepted before God, to have a, quote, new foundation before the foundation of the world, in somebody else's position. And spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. This is how we have eternal dwelling. Somebody else's, quote, position of dwelling, of living together, as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit co-dwell. That's what the word grace means from. It's about co-dwelling with others. If you want to look into the Hebrew of this, and this is what it means to, quote, have grace or to tent or to tabernacle or to co-dwell with others. God says, just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all co-dwell together, we have given you a foundation of dwelling to live with us, to be in our presence. 
Verse 23 says that he brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth youthless, useless. What does he do? He reveals our vanity, reveals our phantom, faded, ghostly imagery that we are, that we're made of the dust of the ground, particles, barely held together. Our true state, verse 28 of Isaiah 40 says, have you not known? He repeats this phrase again. Have you not heard, remember, from the foundation of the world? The everlasting God, the Lord, this is a Hebrew repeat that's giving you insight into the saying, the creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable, infinite, eternal. Melchizedek priesthood, no beginning, no end. The orientation of God is everlasting, eternal. God bases his own existence on his own reference point that he never had a beginning and he never has an end. He is who he is. He is life and he is existence himself. He's always been self-aware throughout all of eternity of who he is. So let's look at the idea of what it means when we say, quote, God chose me. God chose me from the beginning. God chose me from the foundation of the world. Because we're, we're going to have to find out is in ourselves, we're stillborns. In ourselves, we're born estranged. In ourselves, we're condemned through the loins of Adam and by our own, quote, shapenness in the bend that we have towards iniquity and sin. That it takes us about two seconds flat to start sinning the second we pop out of the mother's womb. The scripture's clear. We'll get into this. So, what does it mean to be born again? Is it just transformation? Is it just renewal? Is it just all of a sudden now you just live a different life? Or does it have to do with the orientation of who you are and somebody else in which God reorientates you before the foundation of the world, the ultra foundation, the super foundation, the mega foundation, the inexplicable, indescribable, unsearchable foundation? which is the righteousness and the person of God himself, of his own personal righteousness. Now let's look at Acts chapter 15. This is why you preach the gospel. This is why with this whole thing in which Isaiah says, send me, let me be a gospel preacher. Let me stand at the mountaintop and let me preach. And God says, you're not going anywhere until you are before my presence in the throne room in which there are seraphim going, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. You see, you're going to see the seraphim with the six wings, and Isaiah was brought up to the, quote, picture in which you have a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and then you have in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, where God says, you want to see the pentacle of all things? You want to see the ultra-orientation of why my people are well-pleasing in my sight? It's there at the top of a mountain called Mount Zion, in which their orientation is based upon a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And Isaiah sees that is like shaken to his very core, pronounces death, dumas, I'm undone. I am nothing. I'm a stillborn baby. I'm an aborted fetus. There is no standing I have with you. And God touches him and says, I'm going to orientate my view on you based upon a Messiah, based upon a mediator based upon a representative, based upon him who was baptized in your stead to fulfill all righteousness at the muddy Jordan and that you will be a, quote, cloud dweller, that you will be in the presence of the three persons of the Godhead and be unashamed. And in fact, you could go and proclaim the message and then I'll send you like I sent Isaiah. So John the Baptist is nothing but obsessed with Isaiah because he wants to be a proclaimer of the gospel of course that's all isaiah wanted to do and god says this is the basis of the proclamation from the mountaintop of mount zion you are going to speak as if you're on top of a mountain and you are going to proclaim what it means to be in right standing with me where you are well pleasing you must be born again in whom in what from above above 
We will continue to get into this. Acts chapter 15, look at Peter. He says the same thing. Jeremiah says the same thing. We've already touched on Isaiah. Paul says the same thing. Anybody who, quote, is reorientated and has centered their identity in Christ, they are called born again. God sees you with a different pair of eyes, and he says, I see you as you are in somebody who has literally redone your history. Praise God. Nobody is intrinsically better than another person. Not before God. They're all going to end up in the same burning lake, the unquenchable fire. Isaiah made it clear. John the Baptist made it clear. All the prophets made it clear. Acts 15, verse 7 through 11 says, And after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them and said, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that what the Gentiles might hear from my lips, the message of the gospel and believe God had ordained Peter to be the dude to proclaim to the Gentiles, the gospel. I thought Paul was supposed to do that. No, everybody is. If you are reorientated, born again, born from above, born from a different reference point where God doesn't reference you according to your quote, natural birth. He references you according to the supernatural birth of Jesus Christ. That's your qualification. That's your reference point. That's the esteem that you need to center your esteem on. Whether you are worthy before God is based upon the worthiness of someone who's already been declared well-pleasing. Even at the beginning of his journey of being baptized into humanity and already having the quote, the declaration of the Godhead saying, He's well-pleasing, behold my son, into, quote, at the end of his journey, he's well-pleasing, listen to my son. Christ, Christ, the redo of humanity, the covenantal man before God coming all the way down to being born as an embryo, as we'll get into, as a golem, as the Old Testament says, and he's an image that actually was worked out in pain and suffering that he suffered from the foundation of the very world. And the perfection that was wrought out in him is the orientation that I am going to orientate you. Hallelujah. That is the gospel. That is the good news. And if you get that, if you understand that, if you understand that there's no good thing in you, but what you are referencing is the good thing as Christ is, and you reference your standing before God as you are in another, that God lavishes you and lavishes your words as if you are, quote, being referenced as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world in Christ. You're a co-heir, seated in heavenly places. Verse 8. See, Satan doesn't want you to get this. Satan does not want you to build yourself up in this most holy faith. He wants you to constantly be gazing at your belly button and listening to the little horn power that we talked about earlier. Constantly in that narrative where we're eating with the pigs. Here we go. So Peter said, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He's only talking about the orientation of what it means to be born again in Christ. And Peter brings this up later in his epistle. Not being born of what corruptible but an heir and born of incorruptible based upon the heirship of somebody else. That's the hardest thing to get. Verse eight says, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. That's a sign that you are well-pleasing to God, that you are an heir and he gives you the down payment. I mean, like a, a, a foretaste of, the well-pleasingness and the acceptance of God by giving you the Holy Spirit, just as if you are just before God, just as he did to us. Justification by faith, the reward is now the Holy Spirit. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by what? Faith. God has now told them that your conscience is clear before me, that you can rejoice in me, and that you can now proclaim yourself as sons and daughters of God in Christ. That's your foundation. That's your orientation. That is the pillars in which you can have confidence. 
God is going to shake any pillars that's on this earth. Anything that is of, quote, pattern or type that is of this world doesn't cut it. You need the original. You need the infinite. You need the eternal. You need the foundation that God references your righteousness upon. And that foundation is Christ. God can swear by no one higher than himself. And he came and he entered into the flesh of humanity and he worked out a salvation for you and ascends and represents you. And that's the quote foundation. That's the anchor. That's the core orientation of those who are children of God. And you need to be built up and fortified and edified and encouraged in that faith constantly because your head and your mind and our mind constantly gravitates where? Towards ourself, towards the uh, the things of this world, heavy gravitational pull, eating of the husks, eating of the little horn. Verse 10 says, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. Why? Because the picture is that did the Jews obtain to righteousness, which would make them heirs of eternal life? Did they obtain to righteousness? No. Why? Well, Paul makes it clear. He's a super Jew. He knows. He's a Jew expert. And in his Jewish expertise of Jewry, he said, we didn't obtain to righteousness. In fact, we became a Messiah killing machine. We were just natural born murderers of God. He showed up and we just couldn't help ourselves. We were drunk on our own kind of twisted narratives in our head. We're just a brood of vipers. We attack. We just go on the attack. Every time God speaks, we have an inclination that goes against God, just like Satan, just like the little horn power, just like the OG serpent, Lucifer himself. By nature, children of wrath, children of disobedience, children of rebellion and carousing and drunkenness and our prodigal inclination. This is who we are. We all have got to own the fact that this is who we are. All of us stillborn embryos, bored and disqualified. So we're going to now say, well, you guys need to be like perfect Jews like us now. How did you obtain to the Holy Spirit and the smile and the acceptance of God through your works of righteousness or through the hearing of faith? More on that in another study. Verse 11 says, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Because you're accessing a different foundation. You are born or reorientated or God re-looks at you and re-kind of goes over your history based upon somebody else's history. Defers away from you and to your representative. That's your orientation. Unless you fight the fight of faith, unless you understand that you are an heir according to somebody else, Satan is going to do everything he can to get you to start thinking that it's about how wonderful you are or some innate internal quality in which you become self-fascinated, you go back to the weak and beggarly elements of being self-fascinated. In other words, you're going around promoting yourself as if some special quality exists about you. There is nothing special about th those of us who are made by the dust of the ground, earth and clay vessels. So Jeremiah, people say, well, he was chosen before. You're going to be seeing that he's going to chew. He's going to say that my, quote, embryo is the embryo of the Messiah. I am deferring myself to my position in my Messiah. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 8 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed thee in embryo, I knew thee. And before thou was born, I sanctified thee. We're going, oh, Jeremiah was sanctified in the womb. Oh, wow. He's like super holy. No, you're going to see Paul is going to go through the same process. Born again. The orientation of what it means to be in reference to, quote, the seed that was promised to Adam after the iniquitous fall in which humanity is defiled from the womb, from orientation point through inheritance, through headship, and even the shapen, bent, twisted nature 
in which we're already disqualified shaped in iniquity. And I ordained thee a prophet to the nations, and you're going to see that the prophet was Christ. The prophet is an orientation in which Moses is talking, and he's all saying there is the testimony. The testimony is, quote, the prophecies and all the prophets prophesy of the sufferings of God, the sufferings of the Messiah, the Messiahship, the one who's going to come and be as a lamb slain for the foundation of the world, who himself is going to lay down his life, be numbered with the transgressors. All we like sheep have gone astray. And then God is going to come and do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And God will bear the punishment that we deserve and place it upon himself. And therein we will be justified with God. And God will now look at us just as if we are an only begotten child of God that has always pleased him from the very beginning. This is what it means to be born again by a different embryonic orientation. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. Why? Because I'm a baby and I haven't spoke yet. Moses went through the same thing. He could not speak. When you meet God, he takes you and you see his glory. You go through goo goo gaga phase. You cannot speak. Nya, 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 is what you say. You cannot speak. And then when he says, you are my child, you are an heir. Now you could speak. Now you go and you speak from the orientation of inheritance as an only begotten elder, uh, a child who is now a firstborn. And you speak as if you are a co-heir. You are kind of going as a representative of the ultra, the real, the uh, um, orientation that God is focused on, one person, Christ. So we go as ambassadors and representatives. We go as if we are cloaked uh, uh, in the, the very garments and in, in official business, as if we are doing the bidding of the true, quote, heir. This is the, this is, this is the orientation of the Christian. It's based upon one person's obedience, one per person's perfection before a covenant, one person's righteousness. I cannot speak for I'm a child, just like Isaiah, right? He couldn't speak. And then God had to take the tongs and touch his lips, and then comes the speaking. Same thing with Peter. Hey, Peter, until you're converted, don't speak. Don't feed the sheep. Don't preach the gospel. Don't do ministry. It was after that that Peter's now, hey, I was chosen before the foundation of the world to deliver this message of the gospel. What is he doing? He's being a proxy for Christ, a proxy for the Redeemer. He is sharing the ransom of inheritance from a mountaintop doing the angel work proclaiming the good news of airship and the reward of eternal life as if he himself is a partaker of it and sharing that's the whole point of being the heir the heir is generous <laughs> he gives everything to his uh, co-heirs this is why Christ is so awesome. All inheritance was given to him. And if you get into Daniel chapter seven, he hands all of his inheritance to his people. He has no problem wearing a raggedy down jacket with duct tape on it, driving around in a busted up golf cart, super happy that everyone else is sharing in his super wealth. He finds joy that everyone's sitting around the table, loving and enjoying the great inheritance that none of them deserved. It was gifted to them through inheritance of an inheritor who was generous because you've identified your yourself, your, your, your reference point is not your own righteousness, not your own deservedness, but what was pleasing to the Father was given to Christ. Christ is well-pleasing. And Christ is pleased to give it to whomsoever whomsoever and then you being a partaker is to go about on the same business kind of um venture of going about as a sojourner pilgrim as a proxy as a 
angel with a message from the king being sent to go and say, go share the inheritance. Go to the highways and byways. If the rich, the self-satisfied, the rulers of this world don't want it. Let them, quote, inherit this world and they will perish with this world. But whosoever, because here's the hard part, we have to be meek and lowly and humble of heart. And then all of a sudden, we're going to understand the whole king's business. He's selfless. He's trying to give it all away. But the problem is we're trying to steal it, thinking we deserve it. Ironically, we'll be disqualified in this I deserve it mode. I'm worthy. Now, there's only one who is worthy. The lamb is worthy, who is slain from where? Before the foundation of the world. God's foundation, the eternal foundation, God's reference point. That stone, that's the rock that God builds upon. That's the permanence that God focuses on and orientates himself. The permanence of himself and the three persons that all make up the Godhead. But verse 7 says, the Lord said to me, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. Sounds like the gospel commission, doesn't it? Realize that your inheritance is in one person. And if you have him, you have the inheritance. You have life. You have righteousness. You have the countenance of God resting upon you with great delight. You don't have to orientate yourself, and you should never orientate yourself according to who you are in yourself. The Christian orientates himself for who they are in Christ. That is the gospel. And wh whatever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. There are those that are the self-entitled that see themselves, and they are nothing but robbers and thieves and a brood of vipers. They assume their heirship, and no, nobody is more vicious than people who are in some strange way acting in a high religious, um, like Jeremiah was going to be speaking to the kings of Israel, to the prophets, supposedly, of Israel, to the teachers of Israel, to the priests of Israel, to the rulers of Israel, and that's always been a problem. In Ezekiel's time, in every prophet's time, They've hated the prophets because Christ was speaking, crying, pleading through them. They've always hated the prophets from the foundation of the world because that's Christ crying through them. Saying, I'm the inheritor. Why are you so wicked as to hate me? Why do you want to snatch the inheritance? Why are you being the little horn power? Why are you being Luciferian? Why are you being the fallen angel? Why are you hooked up and joined up with Satan and his fallen angels and that false gospel, that rebellion? You will inherit this world, and this world will be an abomination of desolation. It will be left desolate, and I will destroy the tabernacle of this world. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 10 says, this is the gospel, and Paul is telling you, I am orientating myself in a second Adam, in a last Adam, in an ultra Adam, in an Adam in which he is the true heir. That's the seed that was promised that God would come and enter into the flesh and be the perfection and the true heir of inheritance that he will possess within himself, but he will get a declaration as a son of man through the father. He will be separate like a, quote, um, he'll go on a long journey, and he'll be the son of man, and he will obtain the heirship as a man so he could, quote, impart the blessings of heirship to those who are his companions. Those who wish to be partakers and of co as co heirs, because of his singular generosity, his impulse, God's impulse is to share. God's impulse is to say, "Well, hey, I'm happy. Just I'm more blessed to give than to receive." So, First Corinthians fifteen three through ten says, "For I delivered to you in the first place what also I had received." This is Paul talking about the gospel and the proclamation of being a light to the Gentiles, the orientation from the top of the mountain of a lamb slain. And God's saying, don't say anything until you've been born from above, until you've been born before the foundation of the world, until your embryo starts from the embryo that I look at, that I care about, that I 
lavishly uh, shed my countenance upon and say, that embryo, I'm well pleased. That embryo is the prophet that will be the proclamation to the nations to a good news to the Gentiles that you could be and you will be co-heirs through faith in him because he's your high priest, he's your mediator. And I defer from looking to you, I look to him. He's your representative. He's your ambassador. And by nature and by uh, what God has covenanted with humanity and by the fact that Christ is who he is, everything is to your advantage. If I orientate my judgment of you to him, if I look at him and I call your name, you will have what he deserves. Because you will be, quote, bound up in the rewards that is his. I will defer you to being him. So here we go. What I also received, which is what? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Yeah, all the prophets testified of this reality, of the sufferings of the Messiah who will come through the seed all gospel is based upon the sermon that God gave to Adam and Eve saying, this is how you're going to be restored back to the Garden of Eden again through the seed. And there will be much suffering through the process, but through it all, there will be a restoration back into the garden again. And it will be based upon my skin, me being the Lamb of God, my, I will be slain for you. That's the skins you're wearing that will be rem a reminder as to how you gain entrance back into the Garden of Eden, back into the presence of God, back into paradise. And that he was buried. Who was buried? That he, I should be capitalizing all the he's, was buried. And that he was raised the third day, according to the scriptures, as Christ was in the prophets, Peter said, testifying of himself, saying what he was going to go through. So we don't miss the foundation and the orientation where your airship is going to come from, that seed that's going to be coming through the line of Shem, Seth, Shem. Where's the line coming from? Noah. Coming through Abraham. Coming through Isaac and Jacob. Coming from Judah. Coming through David coming through Mary, Nazareth. That he appeared, uh, appeared to Cephas, Paul, who gave this proclamation of, hey, I was chosen before the foundation of the world to give this proclamation of light to the Gentiles, of airship. Peter's been born again. Peter's orientating himself according to who he is in Christ. Peter has stopped focusing on Peter. Peter has stopped referencing Peter. Peter has seen himself to be, quote, hang me upside down. I am nothing. I don't deserve who Christ is and the merits and, and the lavishing of the worthiness of Christ, of all the inheritance kind of uh, riches and treasures that he gets of eternal life and all of the, the opulence that's going to come from that. I don't deserve it. But I am an heir, a co-heir, and I want to share that with you. If Christ uh, uh, is, is the heir of all things and the Holy Spirit is a, quote, down payment of that, he's going to compel you to go and share the riches. If you are not compel compelled to share the gospel, you got to question whether or not you've laid a hold of Christ. If there is not a compulsion saying, I am miserable until I share the gospel, I will be the most miserable of all people because you don't have, quote, Abba Father being cried out in you in which you have this impulse to make sure that that gospel is being shared, that that inheritance is being shared because that's the down payment. That's the presence of Christ in your heart and in your life in which you have that impulse to make sure that the world gets the light, gets to be co-heirs, gets to partake of this great inheritance, which is life eternal, righteousness before God, and everything that comes through the joy and the happiness and the singing and the pleasures of God in which he loves to lavish. Super, super, infinitely generous. 
Cephas, and then to the 12. And then he peered above 500 brethren at once, this above reference of the cloud over the mercy seat. Baptized into the cloud, baptized into a mediator, partaking of spiritual food, spiritual drink. Christ is our rock. He's our foundation following through this wilderness of this world. And then it says, <coughs> of whom the most remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. In other words, they're not going to miss out. They're going to hear on that faithful day. They're going to enter into their reward and his reward will be with him and he will call out their name. Then he appeared to James and then to the apostles, all the apostles, and last of all, as unto an abortion. What? Yeah. Hey, I'm a stillborn. I'm a disqualified fetus. In other translations, it says out of time, out of place, outside the system, not within the loop of airship. I was born as a troglodyte, you know, he that... uh dancing around the fire, drinking pig's blood. Uh, definitely far from God. I, I thought that I had good uh, pedigree. I had Hebrew stock that would uh, dazzle anybody that read my resume. Uh, I was born as an aborted stillborn fetus that was rejected from a hostile womb that says, get out of here, you nasty thing. Whoa. Well, here's the beginning of Paul saying, uh, I was born before the foundation of the world. <laughs> born again, reorientated myself. My position is what I am in Christ. That's my only reference point. That's why Paul is beside himself telling the world, telling everyone saying, I am not orientated to myself. I am orientated as I am in Christ and there's no other foundation and don't let anyone tell you different. I don't care if they come as an angel. I don't care if you like their storytelling. I don't care if they're good to their cat. I don't care if they're really funny, interesting and charismatic people. Don't listen to them if they're not sharing what I'm sharing about Christ is the truth, is the seed, is the reality of who I am that I reference myself because if I look at myself, do you know what I see? Dung. I see vanity. I see nothingness. I see foolishness. I see emptiness. So he appeared to me also, just like Isaiah, just like Jeremiah, just like Peter, and the two, and James and John. He presented himself as like a, a light dawning out of chaos. He says, I'm your life, I am your righteousness, I'm the foundation of your orientation. Before God, in which you want to have a good report where God declares you righteous. Justified by faith in me. In the orientation that we have. In the, in, in the one who has come in fulfillment of all the prophets. He was telling us, I'm coming, guys. You know he's saying that again. But now, it's for the heirs. This gospel is being preached to you now so you can hear it and receive Christ and be a co-heir and make sure that through this journey, you're not listening to the serpent. You're not listening to the little horn power. You're not listening to this core narrative that we, through inheritance, through an innate inheritance in which we are gravitating to this self-glorification idolatry, be careful that you're not hearing from above, listening to how God sees you in Christ and that you have brothers and sisters that are orientating you as you are in Christ. Be careful. Be careful that people are not leading you into competing against their glory, comparing yourselves against one another like a bunch of werewolves, cannibals, devouring one another. Yeah, this is Galatians 5, 5, and 6. Be careful that you are not orientating yourselves with yourselves. Because I don't care if it's done in a spiritual, religious way. Every single iniquitous regime that has tried to monopolize and do a takeover of God's temple have all been the most guilty people on the planet. Be careful that you are not around those narratives and you become a brood of vipers, Sadducees. 
Pharisees. That you are like Paul. An abortion. Rejected from airship. For I am the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I have persecuted the assembly of God just like a little horn power, just like a husk eater, a little horn devourer. I've devoured the narrative of him with big eyes and a mouth speaking great blasphemies. I persecuted the church. I was doing the Luciferian dance in which I, for some reason, hated Christ, hated the gospel, persecuting Christ, kicking against him. Born again. But by God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace, which was towards me, has not been in vain, but I have labored more abundantly than they all. <laughs> but not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. In other words, the Holy Spirit was imparted to Paul, who says, you are now a co-heir because your orientation is in Christ. And now the love of Christ is being shed abroad in his heart. Romans chapter five, verses one and two. And he's all saying, guess what? I am compelled. I am the most miserable human being if I am not, quote, a vessel of sharing this gospel because that is the impulses of Christ. I'm the least. I am nothing. I'm an aborted baby. By nature, dung, scubalon, husk, a reject, to be cast off, to be rolled up and thrown into the fire and burn. God, do not regard me according to the embryo that I am in myself, not the inner child that needs the inner healing of my <laughs> self-obsessed, narcissistic, worshiping our own wounds. No. God wants you to be worshiping the wounds of Christ. Be careful that Satan doesn't make you super self-sympathetic. Just be careful. I'm not saying that you haven't had real pain. and I, I have. We all have. But it's by his stripes, by his wounds, are you healed. That he has, quote, bore your injustices, the sins against you. Everything that has been an affliction of you, orientate yourself towards him and not towards yourself because there is no healing in self-orientation. Orientate yourself. They hated Christ without a reason. Orientate yourself in that orientation. They rejoiced that they could heap upon Christ false narratives so they could punish him according to their own projection. Orientate yourself as you are in Christ. God will look at you and raise you up and give you all the promises of the scripture that was all, quote, the encouragement and what Christ studied up and down throughout scriptures, he was looking for all the promises that were given unto the Son of Man. Why? Because he's coming to represent himself as the ultra embryo, the ultra human being, the Son of Man. And he took all those promises as if that if he lived out a righteous life and did all that was pleasing in the Father's sight, that God would recover him and that he will trust in God even unto the end, even if he feels abandoned and rejected of God. So he took all the promises as yea and amen for himself because he knew he was living out a covenant perfection of obedience and trust, and he never wavered in any of it. We have all failed. We want God to orientate himself towards Christ and then tell us, compel us, look to him, have faith in him, trust in him, receive the blessings of heirship and of my sympathetic ear of my looking upon you as if you are a righteous, obedient child of mine. Because in ourselves, there's not even perfection in our own victimhood. We've all played a part at some weird level, even if it's subconsciously. There is this kind of self-orientation we got to be careful of that doesn't pull us away from what we have in the true victim, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world what we have in Christ. So what does it mean to be, quote, an aborted, like Paul was talking about? I'm an abortion. <laughs> I'm an abortion. Job chapter 3, verse 16 and 19 says, or as a talk about himself, because now Job is being attacked by the little horn power and he's being stripped of any 
illusions or delusions of himself. And he says, as a hidden abortion, I am not. In other words, uh, I have no existence. I am of nothing. I am not. That's what he means. As infinite, as infants, they have not seen light. I am as if I am in toho boho in this kind of deconstructed state. Still unformed is the idea of what uh, a fetus or an aborted child is. He just basically saying that I'm not even like of airship whatsoever in quote aborted or stillborn status. Reality is I'm not, I am nothing. I am quote, not in the light. And I am not, I am of nothing. This is what, Paul, this is this is what we all have to kind of base ourselves. Children of darkness, children of destruction, children of disobedience. Verse 19 says, small and great, they are all the same. The Jew, the Gentile, we are all of the dust of the ground. We're all sinners. We're all stillborn. We're all rejected. We are all, by nature, non-heirs. See, the Jews forgot that they were given uh, uh, the gospel of adoption. We are all adopted through Christ, who is the true heir. We're all disqualified. Our only hope is in our adoption, and the adoption is based upon the the uh, sonship and the heirship and the fact that everything Christ has done to be a man before God has been perfectly fulfilled as if he's a second Adam and our redo is in Christ. There is no other gospel and there will never be another gospel. If I start preaching something different or if an angel who's better at speaking than I am shows up and is telling you something different, let them be anathema. Let them be cast out. Let them be seen as uh, an apostate. Isaiah 51, verse 5, Behold, this is King David, who rejoices in the fact that he was, quote, a chosen elect one in Christ. But by nature, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Natural orientation. This was based on the fruit of repentance of Isaiah 51. This is Psalms, excuse me, of Psalms 51. This is Psalms 58. Three says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter three, that's talking about everybody, Jew, Gentile, whatever, whatever pedigree you are born from, whatever stock you are born from, whatever good parents you are born from whatever good diet that you have, whatever good disciplines you have in your life, this is you. Paul makes it clear that every mouth may be stopped, that every tongue confess, every knee will bow, everybody will beat their breast, one day realizing that by nature we are all stillborns, we are all aborted fetuses, we are all natural, disqualified, no chance for airship, all and when we wake up to that is the beginning of our need of being born again through somebody else's journey as an embryo on look at isaiah chapter 39 verses 13 to 18 this again is this messianic we keep thinking it's talking about us but the scripture is bearing testimony to christ it's speaking of him his journey his experience what it means for him to be born, for him to enter into the world and to bear flesh, to dawn on flesh, and to come as the seed of the Son of Man. And you'll see this in Isaiah chapter 39, verses 13, 18 says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And again, anyone who has done these studies, will know that if you go and you search out the Strong's Concordance numbers on these things, you're going to see this is the exact language of the veil. And Paul, in the book of Hebrews, is telling you through sanctuary language, orientating this everlasting, eternal quality of Christ, better, 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 better. 
forever, eternal, no beginning, no end. He does something once before the foundation of God, and it has an eternal quality to it. This is Yahweh entering into humanity, working out everything of infinite quality because of who he is. Christ is Yahweh. Christ is infinite. Christ has infinite quality and caliber to what he does. So when he enters back into the foundation before the foundation of the world, which is the pillars of heaven, which is the three persons of the Godhead and their council, which is the ultimate dwelling place of permanence, of life, of co-dwelling, like a bunch of tents in a village. It's this language. It's curtain language. It is the tapestry where Christ says his flesh, his humanity is the veil. Hebrews 10. For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully knitted, woven. Marvelous are your works. It's talking about all those colors and all those works that's on that veil where you see the angels ascending and descending, quote, on the veil of the Son of Man. The knitting of the Messiah. That my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret in the womb, he is being a new creation for us. He's being the, quote, seed from the beginning all the way up into maturation to covenant fulfillment. Christ is our new history. If by faith you lay a hold of him and God can defer from you to him, his history, his covenant perfection. And was skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Get ready for this. And it says, your eyes saw my substance. There's no substance to us. But listen to this. The Hebrew, yet being unformed. We're going to look at this in a sec. And you're, in your book, they were all written. This is the volume of the book written of me. Every single testimony of the scripture was the prophets testifying to the experience of Christ. We're so focused on our experience, we don't understand that God is focused on the experience of Christ. That's the experience that God is looking at. That is the suffering God is looking at. The suffering that made him perfect that Hebrews chapter 5 is talking about is the perfection that God is looking for. That's the foundation of you being well-pleasing to God and you being lavished with the inheritance. The days were fashioned for me. God had set out the works of a covenanted man in which he was born of a woman, born under the law, and all the volume of the books and everything that was written by all the prophets, all of them, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, everything was a testimony to Jesus. And he says, I have to fulfill all righteousness and be the reality of a man in covenant with God for you as a goel, as a go-between, as a mediator, as a redeemer as the orientation in which God can defer to me, Christ, in your stead. There's only one man given him, one name given among all of humanity in which God lavishes and pours all the ointment of heaven upon. Mashiach. One. So don't be identified in yourself. Be identified with your representative who's at the right hand of, the, uh, of God the Father And it's saying, look at me. When as yet there was none of them. In other words, through the entire process, God is saying, can we hit reset on the history of David, of Zach, of John, of whoever, of Vincent, whosoever? Us. Put your name in there. Fill in the blank. Whosoever. How precious also are your thoughts toward me, God. Through who? Through you 2.0 in Christ. Through the one that God defers to. God is well pleased with you because your history is in somebody else. You are to fight the fight of trust and dependence and faith upon Christ. And Satan hates your faith. 
How great is the sum of them? God is so well pleased with Christ that there's no shadow of turning that all the promises are yea and amen in who? In him. And this is how we can rejoice and dance and sing and do backflips and cartwheels. We could say, this is who I am in Christ. And then we could dance before the ark like David and have people criticize us. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Why? Because God defers to the resurrection of Christ for our resurrection. We are raised with his, quote, um, merited life. The merits of his life is why God resurrected Jesus. He was innocent blood that cried out from the ground, the father would not be satisfied until he has restored that life. So none of us are innocent. We are all by nature aborted, stillborn, in, uh, 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 golems, as you saw in scripture. And I'm still with you. Why? When I wake. Because God has deferred to his son that he is the resurrection, he is the life, and based upon his life and his resurrection and his right standing and his face-to-face -face with God, God sees us as we are in Christ. There is no other gospel. This is it. If anyone is telling you there's another version of the gospel, beware, they're preaching another gospel. Let them be accursed. Don't even sit down and eat with them because they're poisoning your brain. They're sending you back into being a, oh, this is what it means to be a good Jew. So let's let's look at this a little further. Let's look at the King James Version of Psalms 119, verse 16. Thine eyes did see my, and I'm going to put my with a giant M, because it's talking about our Messiah, right? Yet being imperfect, the word is gullum, embryo. What's a gullum? It's a clay image that you will see that in Jewish lore, they talk about a golem, an image to God that is like an infant that has no mouth, no, no ability to speak. It has a mouth but can't speak, has eyes but cannot see. And it is like a golem, then you impose life upon it. And we, and these things that we impose life upon, God says, that's blasphemy. Christ says, you want the exact image, the express image? That will be, Christ will be that as the son of man. He will be a clay vessel, a clay creature in which he will now enter into, quote, having eyes to see and a mouth to speak, and he will testify of me and he will look upon me. He will see me and he will be the golem. He will be the clay creature that works out a perfect image of me in a covenant. We know that all golems are Frankenstein. We know that all golems are, our monsters, our King Kong, that were like, ooh, little children, but we only cause destruction. The golem or the lamb-like beast that is an image causes the mark of the beast to be, quote, um, enforced and causes death. All golems are death creatures. Christ was able to be killed because he was a golem. He was an embryo. He was a clay creature. He entered into the humility of being a, quote, clay vessel that is spashable, breakable. He, he, he illustrates this through the communion service and says, OK, let's tear up this bread and let me pass it to you guys as pieces of shards of clay. Like what Job used to scrape himself with. God was broken for us. God gullumed himself as an embryo and worked out salvation, was made perfect through sufferings, made himself breakable, made himself weak, so we could be strong. Like bread is. Bread makes itself weak. It submits. It's given to you. makes you strong. All the irony is wrapped up in all that. In thy book, right, all my members were written. This is all of this, quote, if you want to talk about predestined, if you want to talk about what it means for God to orientate you in some predestined, he's talking about what you are in Christ, not this, he looked at you specifically. He sees you through the lens of Christ. There is no other name given among men where we must be saved. That's the reality. God has single-mindedly orientated himself 
to look at nobody outside the one who kept the covenant, the true heir Christ, the Holy One of Israel, the Mashiach, the Messiah. I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the first, I'm the last. There is no one beside me. That's who Christ is. And Christ does not allow anybody that he shares his glory with because he is the true anointed one standing before God as the son of man. Look at it, it's Daniel chapter seven. This is the reality of what we have before God. It's in one man. Quit, let us as human beings quit focusing and getting this all twisted up in our mind that somehow God is strangely fascinated with us that he decides to start just being random, just choosing people at random. He chooses nobody randomly. You have to be perfect and righteous in your life and your perfection before God, before he could smile upon you in a covenant. And there's only one man who's fulfilled that. And we defer ourselves or we reference ourselves according to what we have in a Messiah. That's all and only the scriptures talking about. Which is in continuance and fashioned. And when there was uh, yet none of them, he could foretell of Christ. Because he knows that he will do all that will please the Father. So this is this, quote, golem. The idea of a golem is a clay vessel. Leviticus 6.28 says, In the earthen vessel, right, wherein was sodden shall be broken. That's why he memorialized himself and says, This is my body. I'm a golem. I am a, quote, clay preacher now. I'm God. I'm still God. I haven't given up my divinity. I can't. This is who I am. I am that I am. I am. And then they tried to. Say he was speaking blasphemies. No, it was not blasphemy for Christ to refer to himself as before Abraham was, I am. All the I am's of Yahweh, Christ absolutely declared his own glory. Even John says that Christ was speaking of his glory when Isaiah saw his glory in Isaiah chapter 6. This was Christ that Isaiah saw. So Leviticus 14.5 says, And the priest shall command that one of the birds shall be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. And this right here is, again, where you get the, the one bird um, you have one bird that is killed in the earth, and vessel, then another bird released. It was a picture of the resurrection, that we are resurrected even though we live in this earth and vessel. Christ came and became the gullum, the embryo. He came and worked out perfection through the trials and the testings of a tried son, an heir, an elect, one who was tested to see whether he can be, quote, one that would receive the inheritance and would share the inheritance. Everything that God is, is looking at us through is the fact that he has one that is a true, quote, son. A son of man who he can say he was an earthen vessel and he has done all that pleased me. And when he was crushed and when he was broken, guess what? He gets resurrected. And that's what this doctrine of Leviticus 14.5 says. It's this idea that there is this dove in which there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in this earthen vessel. And though he dies, you have a dove that's released as a picture of what? Resurrection. All messianic. Jeremiah, how are we sealed? Christ makes it clear. You're sealed in me in John chapter 6. But in Jeremiah 32, that gospel was spoken in this way. Verse 14, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, right? Redemptive, which is sealed, this evidence of which is open and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. Christ is that earthen frail vessel that came as a golem, as the embryo, and redid human history. And based upon his perfection, his glorification of the Father, him doing all that the law required, and him living out in covenant perfection as a son of man, man can be saved. Now, the fact that he is, quote, God in human flesh, it has an eternal value, and he is in, quote, eternal merit. 
he is sharing his own righteousness as if that's going to be the basis of how you are perfect before God. The righteousness of God, more on other studies that we do based upon this, the very fact that we are justified by faith in somebody else's righteousness, whose righteousness is it? Is it the righteousness of the law or is it the righteousness which is obtained to by faith, which is the righteousness of God? So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses um, 4 through 10, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. We're just blind. We're trying to work out our own perfection, our own righteousness, and we don't understand that God has provided a golem, an embryo, a clay vessel to work out righteousness in our stead and it hasn't dawned on our minds. We're trying to obtain to righteousness, right? Through the works of the law. And not through the righteousness of God, which is only obtained to by faith because Christ alone is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of the law is a testimony to God's righteousness. The righteousness of the commandments is a testimony to God's righteousness. It is called the Ark of the Testimony. The law was always a witness and a testimony to somebody else's personal righteousness, which is above the law, which is, quote, the glory in the cloud, which is Christ. The true foundation of the kingdom of God is based upon the righteousness of God. He could swear by no one higher than himself. He is righteous. He is life. He is the resurrection. So who is the image of God? Christ. He's the true Gollum. For we preach, for, excuse me, what we preach is not ourselves. Many people love to draw attention to themselves. Look at me. Look at my Philippians chapter 3, perfection and obedience. Look at me. So based upon the righteousness of who we are in Christ, we have standing before God. But Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of who? The knowledge of God's glory displayed where? In the face of Christ. The righteousness of God is realized in Christ. That's the foundation, the basis of your righteousness. That's the basis of God declaring you just, of declaring you a son, as an heir, as seated in heavenly places, as, quote, pictured, As if you are an only begotten, perfectly fulfilling a covenant, perfectly pleasing the Father from the foundation of your very birth. This is who you are in Christ by faith. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, gullum, earthen vessels, to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. It's because God sends you the Holy Spirit to literally live out in kind, because that's how the whole seed thing works out. In kind, we, quote, manifest the righteousness of God. That's what it means to be born again and to have the impartation of the Holy Spirit, because it's a result that you are already declared perfect and righteous, satisfying God's covenant. So he sends you the Holy Spirit, and then you, quote, have the law of God written upon your hearts testifying to his righteousness. The righteousness that you live out is not a righteousness that merits you anything. It's a righteousness that is a witness and a testimony to somebody else's righteousness in which God sees you as, quote, born again. Sees you as if you are an heir, a co-heir, a son. As if you have a new foundation and that foundation is before the foundation of the world the, quote, foundation of how God perceives you as if you are a lamb slain from the foundation of the world at the top of Mount Zion in which there are angels singing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. 
worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the land, and all them there is. And this is this idea of what even Sabbathing is. It's resting under the canopy or under the hem of the garment of somebody else's righteousness, abiding, hiding, and residing in somebody else's perfection, somebody else's covering, somebody else's glory. So we are hard pressed on every side, not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What does this mean? When God defers you as if you are, quote, an only begotten son, a lamb, don't you think that the, quote, hammered work in which the Gollum or Christ, this embryo who came in as the son of man, born of a woman, born under the law, in which we receive the grace of God based upon his perfection, do we not in turn receive the buffeting, the trial, the assailing and the assault of the enemy of God? Do we not even receive it within our own flesh? Do we not receive it in the, quote, spirit of this world? So if you're not of this world and you are, quote, passing through this life, absent from the body, present with the Lord as sojourners, will you not be buffeted by the little horn power? Will you not be buffeted by Satan? Will you not be, quote, buffeted by the thorn in the flesh? Absolutely. And this is the great reference point that God is orientating you, that the sufferings that you are suffering are not something you should be taking personally. This is something in which all of the, quote, fallen mentality of this world as thorns and thistles and rebellion against Christ is being played out in your life because you are being, quote, referred to and deferred to as if you are hiding and residing and abiding in Christ. This is what it means to be sanctified. This is what it means to be, quote, shapen and molded into the image of Christ is, quote, Christ was made perfect through what? Suffering. He's the perfect golem. He's the perfect image. You want to see? Look at this. The earthen vessel made perfect through suffering. The saving image. Watch this. Because we, images don't save. But why, when Christ comes, works out the image of God through man, the glory of God through man, why is he a saving image? There should be no life in an earthen vessel. It's a crushable thing. Christ says, because it was me who wove myself into humanity that has made, quote, humanity an eternal thing in me when I make all things new. So, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. And what were the prophets? They were servants, just like angels, testifying to the glory and the covenantal righteousness of Christ has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Who is God appointed heir of all things? Who is the one singular inheritor? Christ. How are you or, how are you or I a co-heir? Because we have orientated ourselves to not be identified for who we are in ourselves to be identified for who we are in the beloved, in the elect, the chosen, the holy one. Look not upon me, look upon him who has taken my place. Never to lose this orientation. So, through whom, who's the home? You see, this is again God deferring your identity to somebody else's identity. Through whom also he made the worlds. Through whom did he make the worlds? God's deferring and referencing, quote, his son. This is our representative. So who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, that's a gullum, an image. This gullum is a life-giving image. This is the mystery of God worked out that God became man, and because of the person of Christ, it's without beginning, without end. It has an eternal value, innumerable, insearchable, infinite value that Christ would now bear 
humanity up in heaven and it not be destroyed by the bright glory of God, the Father, but acceptable that he could be face to face and bear the exact image of the Father? Isn't that what you see in Revelation chapter one? What's the image of the Ancient of Days, the Father? Curly white hair, long beard, eyes of fire, feet as burning brass. And all of a sudden, you see the image of that perfectly played out in Revelation chapter one, and it's Christ. Why? Because by beholding, you become changed, and he's the express image of the Father. And the Father is well pleased with Christ. So we read on. And upholding all things by the word of his power. Whose power? Christ. This is who Christ is. The prophets testified of this. And when he had by himself purged our sins, he tread the winepress alone based upon his righteousness. We can have hope in our right standing with God based upon Christ saying, Father, look at my righteousness. How dare any human being say that? You say that as you are in somebody else's human and God righteousness. That's infinite value, Christ. And he sat down where? At the right hand of the majesty on high. Remember when Stephen spoke that sermon and everyone went nuts because he said that I see Christ. He's at the right hand of the father. My perfection is in him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. He completely, Stephen, identified himself the first martyr. What a perfect, quote, end to the time prophecy of the martyrdom of Stephen of that, quote, this, uh, him dwelling with us for a week, and then he's cut in the midst that week. And then we have the apostles, and then the end of the time prophecy is Stephen. What's powerful about that is what does he do? He's bearing a true testimony. He has re-identified himself for who he is in Christ. He was stoned, and he says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To thy hands I commit my spirit. Stephen will be a recipient of the resurrection because of his identity with Christ, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high having becoming so much better than the angels this is the theme of hebrews as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they there's only one inheritor inheritance obtained all the promises are yea and amen so this golem this clay embryo Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Through being a son, did learn by the things which he suffered. He was a beaten work. He was tried. He was shapen. He redid the history of man under trial, under the affliction of Satan, under the temptation of Satan, like man originally was before the fall. Before the fall, was man being tempted by Satan? Yes, before the fall. Did God allow Satan to test man? Yes, he did it to Job as if Job was an heir. And Job had a double portion. He obviously was an heir. Does God allow the buffeting or the testing of Satan to come upon a designated heir? Yes. Why was the very first thing after Christ was raised up in identifying with humanity, and now he is now donning the responsibility as a goel, as a champion of humanity, and he goes right into the wilderness and goes into a trial and a test of being tested as a tried stone, as a true foundation for airship by being buffeted by Satan. So the first thing that happens to you when you are baptized and you're reorientated as if you are, quote, uh, re-identified as Christ, why is it that as soon as you are, quote, in baptism and you are now putting on Christ, why are you instantly tempted? Why are you instantly tried? Because of airship. It's the orientation of what you are in Christ. And Satan has an enmity, a hatred, a, a, a uh, insatiable lust in his hatred towards Christ. And if you are a recipient as if you are putting on Christ and you're being re-identified with Christ, what do you think Satan's going to do? And why is God going to allow it? Because you're going to be a tried stone, tested. That's airship. Let 
he did learn the things he suffered, the obedience, and having been made perfect, he did become to all those obeying him a cause of salvation, age enduring, everlasting, without corruption in this way. Does this make sense? This is Christ becoming the embryo, the new starting point of humanity, the seed, starting in that place in the womb. God knew him there, said, okay, son, we're going to work out a new history of humanity, and it's you're going to be buffeted and tested through a beaten, hammered process. All the sanctuary pieces representing Christ was hammered and beaten, and it's a picture of, quote, being made mature through buffeting. Does God choose us based on our choice to follow him? No, Christ is the only chosen one. If you have, quote, choose you this day whom you will serve and you decide that you're going to hand yourself over to Christ, it's all about he re-identifies you as Christ. Being chosen or elect is talking about one person. It's not talking about random people that he selects in a crowd of people. Like I have 100 million jelly beans and 50 million I'm going to choose. He chooses one. And if you choose or are hidden in Christ, you are saying, don't look at me, look upon him, re-identify me as I am in him. And God says, whosoever, I would wish that all would be saved. I would wish that every jelly bean was in heaven. Yeah, so you have to, quote, say, look not upon me, but look upon me as I am in Christ, including a serpent lifted up between heaven and earth and receiving my natural born judgment. As if I'm a brood of vipers, a, a den of snake eggs being birthed out as the spawns of Satan that we really are. Shape in iniquity, born in iniquity, estranged from the womb. Little snakes popping out of the snake den is us by nature. So God has given a redo of who we are in Christ. And it says, if you laid a hold of Christ, if you laid a hold of the hem of his garment, if you come within the borders and you are identified as you are in Christ, there's only one person I have given inheritance to. So, yeah, choosing Christ, you have just chosen life. Choosing Christ, you have chosen perfection before God. Choosing Christ, you have chosen what's well-pleasing to the Father in covenant and covenantal perfection. Even under trial and testing and temptations, that's what you have in Christ. You have everything that you need to have a perfect history before God and a present standing before God in which he's at the right hand of God. You have no other name, no other orientation. There's only one who is the elect chosen one. That's why I keep saying elect chosen one. Not 50 million, one. There's only one. And God is well pleased with one. And he's called the seed. And Paul says not seeds, plural, seed one. That's it. Re-identified in Christ. That is the gospel. There isn't another gospel. So he was made perfect through suffering. So there is a, quote, partaking of Christ because you're not going to not to be tested. Satan sees you as if you are, quote, hidden in Christ and that you've been re-identified as a co-heir. Will Satan not buffer you? Yes. Will your flesh not rise up against you in its own rebellion like in Romans 7? Absolutely. Because the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit is given to the man who's been identified, quote, as Christ. How were you given the Holy Spirit, Paul says? Through the works of the law or through the hearing of faith, and then now you receive Christ, and he's your identity, and God gives you a down payment of the Holy Spirit. He starts the carving of his, quote, name or his character or the Ten Commandments upon your heart, will there not be an enmity in your flesh? The enmity is not just the, the uh, prince of the power of the air. The enmity is not just the God of this age, which is Satan, Satan. It's not just rebellious sinners who are enemies of God and enemies of the gospel. That's another level. So we're, we're coming down to other levels, not just those that are, quote, in the field, at the mill, in the bed, they are not also the only ones that are the enemies of those that are co-heirs. Your flesh is at enmity and lusts against the spirit 
when God imparts the spirit to you because he is deeming you who you are in Christ, that you're a co-heir. Now your flesh is at war with you. You see how the flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God? It's going to have to be something that you're going to have to render a capital offender, a criminal, on his way to Calvary's cross to die and remember that by nature we are justly condemned. You have to render yourself constantly for who you are in another. You have to look and live based upon who you are in Christ. So this is all played out in Ephesians chapter 2. All of Ephesians 1 is telling you endlessly your election and who you are as chosen in one, in the beloved, in Christ. God singularly only looks at Christ and that is your identity. That is your reality as a saint. A saint isn't based upon who you are in yourself. A saint is who you are in Christ, in the beloved. Saints in Christ. God has deferred you and your supposed reality. He has bound up your identity in Christ. Now, if you are in the faith, Hallelujah. But if you are in pretense and not in the faith, in hypocrisy, bearing the name of Christ, but in no way having a vital uh, faith in Christ, dependence and reliance upon him, you will be chastised and disciplined by the Holy Spirit. You will be properly corrected and reproved and instructed and even in some mortifying way given the rod, but all sons that are true heirs are under discipline. God knows that by nature, we are what? Smoking flax, bruised reeds. He knows our frame is weak. He understands that by nature, we are infinitely far from who Christ is. But what does he say? Look and live, press on to the mark of the high calling. This is what we have in Christ. This is the canopy. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If you're in the sanctified process, he has a canopy over you. And that canopy is the eternal merits of Jesus Christ. And you're growing up in Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 says, And you he made alive where? Who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were stillborns. We were aborted fetuses. This is the point of what Paul, Peter this is what Jeremiah, this is what Isaiah was talking about. They all knew this. There was nothing in ourselves. David knew this. Shaped in iniquity, born in sin. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, you were once spawns of Satan. You were once a viper, uh, a, 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 a den of vipers. You were born out of the snake cave, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. No one is different. God brings down the mountain, and he fills in the valleys, and he puts everyone on a level playing field and says, a ducky must, disqualified by nature. Sons estranged of me, stillborns, aborted fetuses, not natural heirs. By nature, we are children of wrath. By nature. But God, who is rich in the mercy seat and the cloud that dwells in which we meet with God and we hear the voice of God and which is the true foundation of God, which is above us. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even what we were dead fetuses and aborted children that were covered in blood left in the field for the wild beasts to devour by nature, made us alive together where? With Christ through re-identification, baptized in him. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together in identification. Christ identifies himself with us in the Jordan River, rises back up and says, okay, I am now 
representative as a second Adam for all of humanity. Let's start all over again. Let's go into Satan testing me in the wilderness, just like Adam was tested in the garden. And made us sit together in heavenly places where? In somebody else. Don't miss the in Christ is not some mystical idea. He's telling us that this is literally and bodily and actually and pragmatically in Christ. He ascended to heaven. He has entered into the second veil. He is representing us. He is the anchor beyond the veil. This is the reality of what we have in Christ. This is the hope that we have. We need to be building each other up in this hope because everything is trying to drag you down to self-orientation. And there are those that even in their good intentions that are, quote, God, they see themselves as apostles of light and ministers of righteousness. They choose to try to yoke you again to say that you have to still work out your righteousness through the works of the law and in which the law was given as a testimony and a witness to Christ's righteousness. That is a fruit of your salvation. John the Baptist says, I'm putting an ax to the root. The root of your salvation is not the works of the law. That's the fruit. That's because God has seen you built upon a new foundation, the foundation of the righteousness of God, in which there is no shadow of turning because it's come from above. It is, quote, a reality in Christ his own personal righteousness he gives in our place say father look not upon david look not upon whoever look upon me and they will be saved there's no other name given among men in which we will be saved it is only in that one man That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. Where? Based and orientated in Christ, who is the what? Chief cornerstone. The rock of offense. The foundation that's laid, that's no other foundation that can be laid. This is the Hebrew idea as we get into it, where John says, sons, the, I could call these stones. and They could be called the sons of Abraham, the stones, the idea of being a living stone is the idea that the foundation stone is the orientation stone. All other stones that are placed and built upon that building, even the word to build, but nah, is the word for son. When God builds his house or builds a foundation, he builds it on the orientation of what you are in Christ. So if you are a living stone and not a dead stone, he's saying that your orientation is the cornerstone. You are not a stone based upon who you are in yourself, but who you are in Christ, just like Peter, and he calls him a stone. He says, you're the Messiah. You're the Holy Son of God. And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my house. Upon this rock, you will become, quote, fall on this stone, and in other words, you'll be broken and you won't reference yourself. This will be the orientation. Christ and his righteousness will be the basis on you being, quote, adopted. And really the word, but nah, in Hebrew for son, like ben, ben nah, the word for son means to obtain children through adoption. So based upon who you are in Christ, you are called living stones because God is not referring you who you are in yourself, because by nature you are a still stillborn. By nature, you are a golem that is aborted. That's a serpent baby. That's a spawn of evil, estranged immediately. Immediately, we speak as asps and serpents and vipers. Romans 3, quoting from the Old Testament. By nature, we are dead in trespasses and sins. We just got done reading that, right? Didn't we? By nature, we are, quote, dead in trespasses and sins from the womb. So how are we now living sons of God based upon the chief cornerstone, which is Christ, right? His grace towards us, this stone of grace of the book of Zechariah, where it's a stone giving testimony 
that we, quote, God bases everything on Christ, who is the, quote, foundation of humanity, having right standing with God. So it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith in who? See, this is the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. The Jews never could obtain it because they didn't obtain it by faith. They tried to obtain it through the works of righteousness and merits within themselves and not of yourselves. This is the hardest one right here, not of yourselves. There are people here that cringe when you say, not of yourself, it's in Christ. Well, but what about me? What about the realizing in me? What about the manifestation of me as fruit? Well, no, no, that's the root. That's the root. God's got to see this perfection in me before he can. Wow. Oh, wow, wow, you, you you are a very zealous Jew with zeal, but not a godly zeal, not the zeal that God was looking for. You're zealous for your own righteousness. Why aren't you zealous for the righteousness of God that's pleasing to God, which is Christ? Something's wrong. We can't stand the not of yourselves part. It is the gift of God. Not of works. This is, I've, I, I know that I could hear the sound of barfing right now. People can't stand this. <laughs> but it's got to be manifest, realize of me. No, no, no. You're, you're preaching disobedience, David. You're preaching like, uh, uh, uh. Yeah, yeah, you're hyperventilating over all the wrong things. You have no life outside of God orientating you according to the stone laid from the foundation of the world, the stone that followed them through the wilderness. The foundation of God's kingdom is based upon Christ who made you, who created you. And he has created a new works, a new creation. He worked out salvation and creation in himself. He wore a crown of thorns based upon the fact that he bore the very curse of this world. And there's going to be a new heaven and new earth based upon him who is the, quote, new son of man. Which dwelleth righteousness. Lest anyone should boast. Remember what Paul says? They glory in you getting scared and trying to work out your salvation through works of righteousness. And they glory in your, are you ready for this? Your um, neuroses. In your hand washing. In your mask wearing. In your constant, you can't have any peace or, con or your conscience could never be at peace with God because you are constantly on to the next moving goal. Touch not, taste not, handle not. And you're not basing your assurance and, you know, your, your permanent standing that you have based upon what you have in Christ. And what they should be focusing on is your faith teaching you to lay hold of Christ and not trust in yourself in any way, lest you should boast and say that by the works of your righteousness, that somehow that you have a special place with God. And God says, I am no respecter of persons. There's no difference with me. You're all rendered disqualified. That none may boast. Even the Jews, you want to be right with God? It's not through Judaism, not through being a good Jew. Is through what you have in Christ by faith. He is the perfect Jew. He has fulfilled all covenants of Judah, of Israel. He is the true prince that prevailed with both God and man. And now we have grace with God based upon this Messiah. Perfect standing with God. So verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. And what's the word workmanship? Anybody? Five, four, three, two, one. Poeme, poem. You see, Christ is the song. All the songs are written of Christ. All the angels do is sing of him day and night before the throne. So what does it mean, quote, that we are his poeme, his psalm, his workmanship? We are to play out the beautiful, glorious picture in which God is that he made us from the dust of the ground, in which was fully realized in Christ. He played out the song of God before humanity, and it was beautiful. Nobody is more amazing and filled with the beauty and the wonder, the blessed charms of God than Jesus Christ, in which 
I believe when he sang, when he walked out of the upper room, they all sang a song. I bet you he had the most beautiful voice. Jew or Judah means the praise of God, the display of God's glory. This is what's our job description from the very beginning. So Christ says, well, guess what? Now that you are a co-heir and you are sons and daughters of God, guess what? You get your job back. You are my poeme. You are my workmanship. You are to be played out under the various trials and tests and circumstances that you walk through in this life. And you wear a bracelet saying, what would Jesus do? But you actually do what Jesus would do so that I may be glorified among men and the world may know that you are my disciples. Because what is your new job description? You are my poeme. You are my workmanship. You are the display of my glory in all of its melody, in all of its various compositions, in symphony. In symphony with God. That's actually a word in the Greek that's in the Song of Solomon where he says no to self and self hates now him who is obeying the spirit. And it says, because I am saying no to self and the self hates me for that, I am in symphony with God. I am his poeme, I'm his workmanship. I do that which pleases God and I do that which the flesh hates which the enmity that the flesh has for the spirit, I do that which the spirit says to do. And guess what I do? I crucify the flesh. I say yes to the spirit. I say no to self. Self rages and goes into a psychotic tantrum. And even though it's inside of my flesh, I rejoice in the fact that I'm in symphony with God. Of course, Satan can still make music. Haven't you seen the Grammys? Or halftime at the Super Bowl? <laughs> Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Hey, guess what? Reorientated, born again. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them before the foundation of the world. This was man's original job description was to be the glory of God in dirt form, in dust the ground form. As the mud people, the mud people were to... These clay vessels were to glorify God. So let's look at this being born again. We'll start wrapping up here because I know it's already over two hours. Um, I just want to kind of end this. Oof, there's so much good stuff. Um, John chapter three, verses three through 18. It says that Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I said to you, unless one is born again, he cannot say, see the kingdom of God. God has got to see you as a as a, a rightful heir. So you cannot be, quote, born of this world or born of Adam or born, born from the loins of, of this fallen world. So it says, Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's room? What mother is he talking about? Jesus says the mother of New Jerusalem, who's the mother of us all. What does that mean? Listen, your name, name to be your name needs to start out registered in the books of heaven. Nobody's name starts off registered in the books of heaven. Only Christ. He is the volume of the book written of him. Everything is about his righteousness. Everything proceeded from Christ. Everything is a testimony to Christ. Now, what do we have now? There's only one name registered in the books of heaven. It's the Lamb's book of life. Slain from the foundation of the world. And Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That's the whole purpose of being a Jew is that God reorientates you according to a lamb slain. And that priest is now bearing the sin of that lamb before God and bearing that as a mediator and as an intercessor, a substitute and surety representing Christ, the lamb representing Christ, the priest representing Christ, the temple representing Christ. Destroy this temple, I'll raise it back up in three days. 
though, says the Holy Spirit should have told you this. Hey, the wind blows where it wishes and you can hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the spirit, you don't know my orientation, he says. You don't know that I came from above, do you? And you think this is what Christ is talking about? That's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about, I'm from the cloud. I'm from the Shekinah. I'm from above where the mercy seat is, above the law, above the manna. I'm the mercy seat is where my seat is, the seat of kafar, of covering. And that work where you had the angels in which their wings were touching, I dwell above that. And I call you, and you'll see this in Exodus 25, when you're baptized, you're baptized into Moses in the cloud, and you're born again from above, from where the cloud is, from where I've told you to meet with me, that I may remove your filthy garments because what was hanging between heaven and earth, but a serpent, which was me bearing your sins of the handwriting of ordinances that was against you. And because I was innocent and I was an innocent lamb and I am God in the flesh. I can have the sins of the world imputed to me and you could be made the righteousness of God in me, in my innocence, in my perfection. And I will impute to you my righteousness. That's the gospel. This is above the law. The law is a testimony to his righteousness, but it is not actual manifest righteousness god says the actual righteousness of god is god now you can work out the works of righteousness you could work out the testimony of righteousness you can even work out the witness of righteousness the image of righteousness the pattern of righteousness is your duty as a creature you have no other duty but you are never the righteousness of god You are a reflection of that righteousness. You need to be born again. You need to be orientated for who you are in your representative. That representative happens to be your creator. So Nicodemus <clears throat> said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him and says, you're a teacher of Israel. You don't know these things. The entire He missed the entire point of being a Jew, being an Israelite. You don't understand the plan of salvation. You don't understand the doctrine of, a, of adoption. That the oracles were testifying of this very thing. All the writings testified of me. And now here I am. And yet you cannot see me. The whole orientation of the Jewish economy was based upon a Messiah being the reality of life and righteousness this and bearing the sins of God's people. So most assuredly I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we've seen. Jesus is the true testimony, the true witness, the true law is being played out perfectly in Christ. He is God. The law testifies to Christ, but now he's going to be a testimony of the righteousness of God in human form. He's going to be a true witness. We were called to be his witnesses. And you do not receive our witness. Who's wit who's our? Who's our? Him and his disciples? No. The Father Son, and the Holy Spirit were testifying of Christ, even at his baptism, saying, This is my beloved son. This is your Goel. This is your champion. This is the one who is now taking on the task of Adam 2.0. This is all about this true witness that First John is talking about. So if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Why? Because he's from above. He's from the, the cloud above that was represented in the tabernacle in which God was giving a micro kind of picture of what the reality is of creation. God is living from a foundation that is beyond the foundation of this world. When we are born again, 
before the foundation of the world, it's talking about in Christ and God is orientating your origins, your embryo, your, your do-over as a human, totally in your substitute. So he's talking about this heavenly realm in which 13 says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the son of man. I'm coming in human flesh to tell you that my or origins are the foundations of the universe with the testimony of the Father and the Holy Spirit. We all testify to each other, and these three are one, and we bear true testimony of each other. That is the foundation of God's government is the righteous testimony that they testify of each other and saying this is the foundation of God's throne is his righteousness. Who is in heaven and Moses as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man, the same son of man here. Who is testifying of this reconciliation between heaven and earth must be lifted up, right? And if he be lifted up, there's our born again status. He'll draw all sinners unto himself. We all realize that we're all defiled, natural born embryos that have been aborted or stillborn, miscarriage. Be lifted up that whoever believes in him would not perish as aborted fetuses, but have eternal life airship for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son only begotten is airship one that is the quote one that is considered the rightful heir that's all he's talking about the one chief one in which he says that's the one right there that's the one that gets the inheritance be quote orientated in your identity in Christ you want to be in an identity crisis in yourself perfect Find your identity in Christ. Do not find your identity in yourself. Do not find your identity in your pedigree. Do not find your identity in your upbringing. Don't find your identity in your culture. Don't find your identity in your race. Don't find identity in your denomination. Don't find identity in anything. In your classist status. Don't find your identity even in, hey, I'm a, I'm a ghetto, street, fabulous, whatever. Don't find your identi identity in anything in your education don't find your identity in anything if you are even somebody that is famous or somebody that is considered privilege or even if you're a little bit tiny bit smarter than somebody else don't find your identity in that don't find your identity in your artistry in your job don't find your identity have an identity crisis in everything and then re-identify yourself for who you are in Christ. Then you will have eternal life. Anybody who calls himself a teacher in Israel and doesn't teach this, they're disqualified as a teacher. They are not preaching the gospel. They're preaching all this other false identity, false prophet, false teacher nonsense in which you can take glory in these other fake little um, orientations of how important you are or or what status you have with God, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, just like Herod, just like what the um, scribes and what the priests and the rulers all did to their peril. And they pierced him. And they will ask for the rocks to fall upon them on that day. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He came on a inheritance salvation kind of uh, 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 journey. He came on one mission idea, and that is to give inheritance to human beings as the son of man. But that the world through him might be saved, whosoever. He's going to create a new heaven, a new earth. He's going to destroy this world. He's going to turn it back into Toho Boho, as per Jeremiah chapter 4. He's going to do a big, giant redo after the destruction of the wicked. They shall be his ashes below his feet. This is the great furnace fire where, where the earth becomes the hell. The lake of fire is earth. That's in Malachi chapter 4. That's in plenty of other scriptures. 
And then based upon a Toho Boho experience, it, he goes back into a six-day creation. No one's going to have to, quote, have faith that God created the world in six days and the seventh day he rested. There's no more faith anymore. There's no more hope. It's all seen with the eyes, and you could touch it and taste it and feel it, and everything's experiential then. Now it's safe to go by experience and feelings. Now everything is this magic land, delusional land. You can't trust anything other than the gospel. I would say don't trust anything outside the gospel. Nothing. Have confidence in nothing else. Verse 18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only, orientation one, holy begotten, only, chosen of God, elect, the holy one of Israel. All prophecy is falling on the head of one, begotten son of God. Don't get this mixed up. John answered and said, this is John who's, who's giving testimony to Christ. God does everything with a witness. So just like in your life, if you are justified by faith beyond the law, without the law, what is the testimony that you are saved by grace through faith? You are his workmanship, and guess what you do? You have the law of God to be carved out in your heart through life circumstances. You are to trust and obey the works of the Holy Spirit, uh, works of faith through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and your life is a testimony. And John was testifying to Christ. Your sanctification is a testimony to your justification. That's not that confusing. So John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it had been given to him from where? From heaven. From the Shekinah above. From the, from the glory of God's foundation. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. How many of us need to really start understanding you're not the Christ? You're not ever going to be equal with Christ. You will never equal the pattern. You will, in a life of testimony and sanctification, be a reflection of it, but you will never be Christ. Stay in your lane. But I have been sent before him to testify of him, to show who the real righteousness that God is pleased with. He must increase and I must decrease. Here's another canker sore in the soul of the self-righteous. How many people love to hear you must decrease? Christ and the testimony of Christ and the presentation of Christ and how you esteem in the minds of other people Christ instead of them admiring you in who Christ dwells as a kind of like a it's small print, Christ in you. But it's the in you part you like. Look at me. Look at the way I present Christ. Get everyone fascinated with the cult of personality. Is that a, a epidemic, a pandemic in the church of God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, everyone is spinning their kind of, their, their shtick, their style, their flavor of Jesus Christ to everybody. It's sickening. It's disgusting. It's not about don't look at me, look at him. No angel was sitting there polishing their resume, and then you get super, the second you get angel fascinated, he says, no angel worship, get away from me, you're trying to get me killed. We don't focus on ourselves. We focus, we come to bear testimony to Christ. Christ. That's all any angel would ever do. What are we doing? Trying to get worshipped. Verse 31, this is John still speaking. He, come, he who comes from above is above all. This is where you get your righteousness from. Not from the works of the law, but from him who is above all, who dwells in the clouds where the real pillars and foundation of the throne of God is. And he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. And all they can do is focus on themselves and one another. Who's first? Who's better than the other person? How can I compare myself? How can I rejoice in somebody else's downfall? Because that puts me up a notch in the crab pot. He who comes from heaven is above all. So where do you think this righteousness that you are going to have your confidence and your security in? It's from above. It's from the foundation of God, which is 
his righteousness. And as we go into parts two or three of this study, you're going to see that the foundation of God's throne is his righteousness. That's how you are, quote, um, given righteousness through imputation. It's based upon the righteousness of the three persons of the Godhead in which they have founded the righteousness of God's kingdom on their own personal merits. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. Why? Because we want to receive our own righteousness. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God for God does not give the spirit by measure. And what's he saying here? The Holy Spirit, who he kept referring to earlier in the discussion, that's still here in John 3, is talking about the Holy Spirit is testifying to Christ, is reminding you of who Christ is, telling you of what sin, righteousness, and judgment is. Sin, you didn't believe in me. Righteousness, I ascended to heaven to mediate for you. And judgment, that Satan and his brood are all going to be judged based upon them not having righteousness. Though Satan comes as a minister of, of righteousness and an apostle of light, an angel of light, but he has no righteousness of God. He's thought to establish his own righteousness. Any danger in that? Okay, I think I'm going to, oof, this is hard because we're already at two and a half hours, you guys. So this is really hard because I'm really wanting to mm, we have to part two this because what I'm going to do is try to get you guys to remember this part one. And then part two is going to be Paul now is going to say these things. You know why I now am not a stillborn baby, an aborted baby. And Paul's going to go into Galatians one. I was born again through the gospel, which is Christ is my history. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my heirship. All the promises are yea and amen in Christ. Therefore, don't look upon me, look upon him. And by the grace of God, I am who I am based upon not my identity, but based upon my identity in him who's at the right hand of God. Therefore, I have confidence before God. And guess what? In myself, nobody's more disqualified than me. I persecuted the church. I was a psycho. I was a super psycho. So this psycho would be judged by God for persecuting Christ. I would be a little horn power. So I rejoice that I get to now be re-identified in the gospel through him who worked out righteousness in himself. So let's do um, finish up here with John 3 right here, and then we'll just part to this if that's okay. okay. And I hope you guys come for part two because you're going to really want part two. So this is born from above, right? So verse 35 says, John 3, the father loves who? The son, the true heir, the true inheritor. If the father's eyes are fixed upon the son and only on the son, is only pleased with the son, and only talks to the son as an only begotten, only. Don't ever forget the word only. Where should our eyes, who are in the danger zone, who have the risk of being destroyed because we got our eyes off of Christ and we decided to orientate our identity in ourselves, in our race, in our culture, Whatever, whatever, whatever ideology, whatever bizarre set way, journey, path that we have found to go back into this journey into self-fascination, we'll find some way to do it through our sexuality, through our popularity, through our self-fascination with our own charisma. You know the word charisma, char where you get charisma from? Go look it up. That's where you get the word mark from the mark of the beast from, charisma. 
You are just so caught up in your own charisma, your own identity, and you will be destroyed as a beast. You'll be destroyed as a man that is not fulfilling covenantal righteousness, and there will be no place for you. You'll be destroyed. 666 is the number of man and beast. Six, 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 six is a, is a serpent eating its own tail. You're self-consuming. Den of vipers. The father loves the son. So where should our eyes be focused upon? Look and live. Orientating, orientating your identity, your foundation, your orientation, your history needs to be caught up with the history of Christ, not self-fascinating, some weird postmodern fascination with your own voice, your own journey, your own telling of your story. That is Satan's giant trap, giant lure, giant, massive delusional deception is to get you self-fascinated with you and your story and your narrative and your salvation is based upon the story and the narrative of somebody else who lived 2,000 years ago. That Paul made it abundantly clear in 1 Corinthians 15 who that dude is. And that dude is Christ. That dude is Christ. And has given all things into whose hand? How many things? All the promises are what? In who? In Christ. He who believes in the Son has, he who dwells in everlasting burnings, the righteous one, the upright one, the eternal one. Daniel's three friends did not were not destroyed by fire in a furnace because the Son of God was there saying, hey, that's, that's what it's like to be in the presence of my father, a fiery stream issuing before him. Guess what? Doesn't touch you. They probably living in some kind of a little garden tea party. They really thought they were in some kind of paradise. They weren't seeing a bunch of flames. It's not even the smell of burnt hair or their clothes weren't even burnt. There was nothing. They're completely having a good time in there. They could have stayed there all day, all night. In fact, I don't think they wanted to leave. This is what it means to be re-identified with what it means to be in the presence of God in Christ, because God is a consuming fire. The reality is nothing can stand before God, but somehow the eternal quality of Christ is the paradise of God in the presence of the Father. He is the tabernacle in which we dwell in, and it is a paradise. Get your mind wrapped around that. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe on the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Can it be any clearer? Can there be any more? Have you not seen? Have you not heard? Has not anyone spoken to you? This is the truth. This is the foundation of your confidence. This is where you should be building your foundation. This is the last of our reference point. So what I'm doing, I was going to go into Young's literal translation of a couple verses and get you to see this idea of not being born, quote, from the works of the law, but being born from above, which is above the law, and that is the righteousness of God in which the law testifies that righteousness is written upon stone. It is a witness and a testimony to an objective testimony, an immutable testimony, a testimony that will never go away. God's glory will never change. That law is a perfect witness and testimony to the righteousness of God. But there is something about the righteousness of God in which if Satan stands at the right hand of God accusing you of transgression and your garments are filthy, God can say to him, the Lord, Yahweh rebukes you. Why? Because I've imputed the righteousness of God. When Satan's accusing, when Kate, Satan is shaming, when Satan is sitting there giving a case as to your disqualification in the court of in the in the court of the law, because you're because why do you say the Lord rebuke you? He's saying because you are impugning God. It's not the likeness of God's righteousness in which is imputed to you. 
to deal with the fiery accusations and the darts that Satan slings upon you to try to get you to focus on your own belly button, orientating yourself on you. He says the Lord rebukes you. Why? Because you are tempting the Lord. You are saying that the Lord's righteousness is not righteous. God's righteousness. You see, that's what imputation is. That's what substitution is. That's what Goel representation is. God says, I'm not giving you a likeness of my righteousness. I'm giving you the orientation that he is impugning me. I am righteous. I have shed my blood, the blood of God, to be as a cloak and a covering, a kafar, a mercy. I am the ark in which you dwell in, in which the wrath of God can be poured out and you could be safe. Through my death, my burial, my resurrection, that's my righteousness he's accusing. And I rebuke him. So this is what it means to be born from above. Different orientation now. And you better surround yourself with people that help you to see the promises that were true and which are all for Christ. He has now, all the promises are yea and amen in Christ. He is now the rightful heir of all the covenantal promises of God to the son of man. He is the true Israel. He is the ish. He is the man. He is the son that was well-pleasing. He is the inheritor. This is the one in which God orientates himself says that man has everything and whomever has faith or trust in him, whoever comes to him in no wise will be cast out. You will be a co-heir. You will receive the lavish blessings because of who he is. Now that's being born from above, from God's righteousness. So here we go. We'll end on this. John 3, verse 7, verse th John 3, verse 3, verse 7, verse 31 says this. In the Greek, Young's literal translation, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, him, verily, verily, I say to thee, if anyone may not be born from above the Shekinah glory, above the mercy seat, above the law, is not able to see the reign of God. You will not co-reign with him and be in his kingdom as kings and princes and priests and rulers, and judging the 12 tribes, and judging the angels. You will not share in that if you're not born from above. Verse 7, thou mayest not wonder when I said to thee, it behooveth you to be born from above. Not from pedigree here. The pedigree that God is looking at, the birth pedigree of the book of Matthew and the book of Luke is orientated on Christ. He's the only pedigree that God honors, that God validates, that God says, yep, that fulfills and seals up and perfects the righteousness I was looking for. It behooves you to be born from above. Verse 31 says, he who is from above is, com is coming, excuse me, he who is from above is coming is above all. And he who was from the earth, let me just put this, born from the Shekinah, born from the cloud, born in the zone in which the foundation before the foundation of the world is your, now your orientation. Of this world, you're a stillborn, aborted fetus that's disqualified, estranged from the womb, deserving to be destroyed, head dashed against a stone, no heritage. You are literally crushed upon the stone. Now, he who is from the earth, and from the earth he is, and from the earth he speaks, and he will be joined to the earth, and he will share in the destruction of the earth. But he who is from heaven is coming is above all. That's the zone and the orientation. And so that's how I want to sum up this study. John chapter 8, verse 23 says, and he says to them, you are from beneath. You are of your father, the devil. You are a, you are by nature disqualified by nature's children of wrath. By nature, sons and daughters of disobedience. 
born in darkness, born disqualified without inheritance. But I, Christ, says, I'm from above. You want to be baptized? Be baptized into the cloud. You want to be baptized into a new identity? Be baptized, quote, into Moses, which is a picture of a mediator who was drawn up from this world and is the seed of man and is now face to face with God as a friend. Moses as a mediator picture. I'm from above. You want to be born from above? I am not of this world. And so if anyone's trying to get you to orientate yourself as to what your qualification, what your disqualification is, or whatever you think in which they bear testimony and they get together in their board meetings or in their councils or in their whatever they decide to do in their bylaws or their policy books or something else, God laughs. God laughs at people that even run administrative positions in churches that think that they're the one that designates who does what in the body of Christ. Yeah, there has been an institutional takeover, a seizure of God's institution by a den of thieves because this is the end of days. This is just like it's it's a 2.0 of the condition of the church is exactly what it was before the first advent of Christ 2,000 years ago. And we're in the exact same state with the exact same um, politicizing, uh, the spiritual politicizing, the who's the best, who's the first, and the exact climate that you see with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and then how they're joined and they're parlaying with the government, but yet they're playing footsies underneath the table with Pontius Pilate playing their authority games, hating Christ, building a culture of Christ hatred by some of the most zealous people, such as Paul. He thought he was doing a good thing by persecuting the church. That's who Gamaliel, who, that's his big obsession. You are honoring God by attacking the Christians. It's in his writings, by the way. So anyway, you guys, that's it for our study. I know it's a long study. It's a great orientation uh, for this idea of what it means to be born again, born from above, a new creation in Christ, reorientating yourself totally in that, and then finding people, number one, do that by reading the scriptures. Everything that applies to Christ applies to you. Everything that was promised in the scripture has now been defaulted to Christ. It's now all his. It's all summed up and sealed up in the Messiah. That's clear. That's what happened on Calvary's cross. It's in Daniel chapter nine. And he sealed up the vision. Everything has been orientated and designated. And now everything is now in the camp of Christ. He has now seized the inheritance. It's solely his as an only begotten. God has only designated it to Christ. Now, if you are Christ's, you have it all. If you are reorientated in your identity in that inheritor, you have everything that's Christ. So you could go through the scriptures and see all the promises are yea and amen for you, not based upon some quality in you, but based upon the quality in Christ. Re-encourage yourself, fortify yourselves, edify yourselves, build one another up in this most holy faith, realizing the foundation is Christ. Okay, this is the key. And then finding others that do the same thing. Now, they're going to drag you back to your own navel gazing. It, the Bible says don't even sit down at the table and don't even have fellowship with them. This is essential. You have a fight of faith to endure, and it is a raging battle zone. This is something that you may lose everything in your fight of faith, but you have Christ, and you'll have everything in Christ. You might live a life of Job where you lose everything. You might live a life of Jonah and lose everything, but you have Christ. Reality is, is that there's a great enmity against your faith. The shield of faith is a very real thing, and you cannot quench the fiery darts of the accusations of Satan without your shield of faith. And he wants to do everything he can to remove your shield of faith, and then there's no ability for you to not experience the accusing attacks of your adversary who is spending day and night playing tapes in your head telling you how naturally disqualified you are because you're such a low life. Satan knows how to play that game. Your orientation is who you are in Christ alone. 
and that's it. And then you find people that are going to build your identity for who you are in Christ, that you look away from those things that are past, you move on to, you know, your your focus for who you are in Christ. If whatever faults or mistakes or sins or wrongheadedness or whatever you had, you confess them before God, you go naked before God, and then he cloaks you with his righteousness, and you don't let anyone drag you back into that old identity because what you need to remember is that we are building each other up into our identity in Christ so that when we see him, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is because our eyes are fixed upon him. By beholding, you become changed from faith to faith, from glory to glory. You keep your eyes fixed upon him. And even though to you, you don't see the change is imperceivable. Don't worry about it. Stay fixed on Christ. And the the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. With the right hand, lay hold of Christ and let the le left hand do whatever you got to do to be as a rudder in your life. To move and make your moves. But lay a hold of Christ. Be like that woman who is issuing blood. Lay a hold of the hem of his garment. Be like Jacob who's wrestling through the night, realizing that he really screwed up with his brother Esau and used deception to try to gain the inheritance and he was very troubled. And then again, another person who had a death grip on the robes of somebody else's righteousness. All right, you guys, thanks for being a part of this study. God bless and keep uh, each other in prayer because we all want to be uh, seated at that table and we want our name called. And no name is going to be called outside of the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, and us being re-identified in the Messiah. There's no other name given among men in which we're going to be saved. That's it. There's only an only begotten one, an only begotten. This is our key to our confidence. And let's build each other up.